Welcome in to Shot and Vip, a podcast brought to you by Inside Carolina this football season by Johnny T-Shirt, our friends over at Johnny T-Shirt. Co-hosting this, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and I'm joined, as always, by my fellow Carolina football letterman and teammate, Jeff Schottmer. Shot, North Carolina gets back in the winning ways. They're 7-2 and two now on the season after beating up on Campbell 59-7. to seven. Uh, not, not a ton to take away from uh beating a, an fcs opponent but we're, we're still here we're still going to break down this game and, and preview north carolina on the season as a whole what were your opening thoughts from from the win against campbell yeah before i get to my analysis i wanted to you know mention two things one i'm wearing my military appreciation threads as you can see so shout out you know all the troops we appreciate you guys um and the second thing i want to say is you know thoughts and prayers to one of our Tar Heel greats, Cole Holcomb, you know, he had a devastating knee injury on Thursday night football. Um, you know, he's going to be sidelined for probably nine, nine to 12 months, probably, probably miss all of next season. You know, he's beaten the odds before and, you know, my money's on him doing it again. So Tar Heel faithful, you know, keep him in your thoughts and prayers because, you know, he uh, a very devastating knee injury and he was playing some, some really good football and just signed a, you know, a three-year deal with the Steelers in the off season. So um, keep him in your prayers. Um, but, you know, back to the game, um, you know, the, the heels were a, a derailed train and at least we put the train back on the track. Uh, it wasn't the prettiest start by any means, but but we ended the game the way we needed to. You know, when, when you play an FCS opponent, the score should look, you know, 59 to 7 or 63 to 3 or, you know, uh, 55 to nothing. You know, the, the score should be very lopsided at the end of the game. Um, you know, the three things that should happen. Number one, you should win and win handily, which we did. Number two, you should, you know, stay healthy. Um, we, we've seen in the past, I think Jacorius Conley got hurt against an FCS opponent a couple of years ago. Like you never want to see a, I'm not talking about like an ankle injury. I'm talking about like a catastrophic injury. That's, you know, that really sets your guys back. And, and I think for the most part, we stayed healthy. And then the third thing is, you know, you want your young scholarship guys to, to get reps. You know, there's nothing like live, live action and, and live bullets. So, you know, for, for some of our young players, uh, especially at, at the quarterback position, because we know that Drake is not coming back, there's no chance he comes back. Um, so Tar Heel fans, get that out of your head. <laughs> uh, but, you know, our young scholarship players to get reps and uh, on, on all sides of the ball. Um, so I, I guess, you know, it was, a, it was a, the win was a success because we did all those, all those three things. Yeah, Jaquarius Conley, I believe it was an ACL injury returning a kick in in like a Wofford game where yeah. meaningless, meaningless reps and um, was was never really the same player after that knee injury. One of the um, one of the areas that the coach Fedora teams have kind of gotten praise over the years is how well they were able to handle these FCS opponents where you guys go in, you're up, you know, 40 points by halftime and you, you once you come out of the locker room at halftime it, it's just bench guys what kind of mindset do you think it takes to to play these teams where you know that you're you're more talented and that if you just execute your job you should take care of business i mean the mindset should have been to start fast you know jump on them quickly you know the the, the difference between fbs football and fcs football for the most part is the lines of scrimmage. And I'll, and I'll talk about that later in the podcast, but, you know, obviously some FCS schools have some skilled, skilled wide receivers and running backs. And some of them usually have, you know, a quarterback that can really run. Um, but where they're deficient is the lines of scrimmage. So for us, it, it should be, we, we are the bigger, stronger, more physical team. We dominate the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. It should be overwhelming force on both sides of the ball. You know, when you're playing an inferior physical opponent, you all you should be doing is running the ball, and they shouldn't be able to run the ball on you. And, you know, for, for the first half, that wasn't really the case. Um, it, in a game like this, it should be – starters should really be out after the first drive of the third quarter. You know, it's – you get you get the young guys in, and um, you get the guys that don't – you know, maybe even the, even the walk-ons that aren't, aren't even getting any reps at all. You know, maybe they get a couple – handful of snaps at the – at the end of the game, but this is a team camaraderie game where everyone's getting in the game. You're winning by 50 something points and it's everyone's getting their Instagram picks for after the game. So 
uh, and, and, you know, you can tell the girls at the frat that, Hey, did you see me in the game? You you saw know, me? I, I, I got in there. You see that? <laughs> but, um, look, it's, it's what it ended up being, but you know, it was a sloppy start. You know, I starting from the first drive when we were on defense, uh, there was two long quarterback runs that Campbell had against us. And it was a very similar scheme that Georgia tech ran against us. You know, it was just a, a counter read, kind of kind of play and um you know they're pulling the guard tackle and we're reading the in man line of scrimmage and the quarterback just pulls it and and look we we should have a bunch of bank reps at that play and it's obviously hurting us and going forward it's a copycat league and campbell obviously saw we we didn't handle it well and uh if you think that duke clemson and state are going to do the same thing then you're crazy um you know and then, and then our first offensive drive we go three and out and we let up a sack against a very basic four-man rush. It wasn't like Campbell drew up this elaborate, you know, blitz or um, insane scheme. It was just their edge rusher, you know, whooped our left left tackle around the edge. And then, you know, we go down and score, obviously, the next drive. And then we let up a 40-yard kickoff return. You know, so it was just one thing after another. We couldn't really get in a true rhythm. And, you know, it was, it was all three phases kind of not pulling – you know, not doing their part to the fullest at the beginning. Um, you know, obviously we, we let up a one touchdown in the game and that was in the first quarter. And, and from what it looked like to me, it was a blown coverage in terms of we were playing a bracket coverage and power Eccles was kind of the underneath player and uh, Hardy had, you know, three vertical and he kind of got lost in the shuffle. But, um, you know, I, this should have been a 14 to 10 game with four minutes to go in the first half. You know, that that's, the uh, at the end of the first half it was twenty eight to seven, but the score at the end of the half was a lot different than what it looked four minutes with four minutes to go. You know they they missed like a thirty yard field goal, so we stay up fourteen to seven. But um, just all, all in all, kind of a sloppy start. We righted this, we righted the ship and uh, ended up winning by you know fifty plus points. But um, definitely some alarming things um, you know coming after those two losses. Uh, you know, to UVA and Georgia Tech. I, I thought we were going to come out firing like we did against Georgia Tech and, you know, be up 21 to nothing at the end of the first quarter and look up and they have 17 yards of total offense, but that wasn't the case. Yeah, the FCS games were always my favorite when we were playing. It was it was a game I had starred on, on my calendar. Like, you guys were looking forward to the Miami game. No, I was looking forward to North Carolina A&T, Delaware. I was looking, <laughs> where can I kind of get mine? And the, the mindset that we always had, like, Mac Hollins was going to have his pads essentially off for the for the second half of games. You look at this North Carolina team, and some of the highest snap counts that they got were from their best players. Kamon Rucker, 57. Cedric Gray, 55. These are guys that Carolina is going to need to play a lot down the stretch when you have the better competition, the, the Dukes and Cle- Clemson in Death Valley, NC State. How worrying is it, do you think, that that these guys do have to play such a high snap count number in a game um, in a game like Campbell, knowing how much they'll need them down the stretch? Or is that something that can kind of get overblown because these guys are, you know, 18 to 22 year olds and, and they they can handle playing a lot of snaps? I, th- I think it's two part. I think, number one we would like to see their, their snaps limited, especially came in and, and said, because they've played, you know, hundreds of hundreds of snaps in their college career and they've been proven productive players for our defense. Um, but the other part of it is, you know, came in and, and said, or are, are in such good physical condition that, you know, normally in a game they'd play 70 plays and then playing 50 something. Uh, it, it's not the end of the world, but we talked about it in the, in the, in the podcast, you know, start the podcast brief preview for the year in August is like, these are the games where we want to see our best players play a half of the football game, you know, 25 to 32 snaps and then get out because we're trying to build depth. And the only way you build depth is, is, is to get guys playing and more guys should play. Um, and, and maybe we were trying to get said, you know, trying to run up his stats a little bit, you know, we're trying to, he solidified himself as first team all ACC at linebacker for the, second straight year. Um, but you know, stat game maybe for said and maybe said went to them and was like, I don't want to come out because I don't like how our defense is playing. Maybe that was him. And if you're the defensive staff and you have a guy like said, 
you know, he kind of calls the shots and if he wants to keep playing then let him keep playing. But um, I, I, I don't, I don't think it's a huge issue. 50 something snaps, you know, um, we, we got bigger issues than that. I think. Yeah. That, that first quarter, I, I thought if you just watch Cedric Ray, you could kind of see his frustration with the defense and, and it, it felt tangible how frustrated he was looking back to the sideline and, and looking to players and trying to get them lined up. And, you know, I, I think there is a, a pride factor with somebody like Cedric Ray who knows that the defense should be a lot better. He's playing like a, a first-team all-ACC selection. And we've talked about at times, like, last year the defense was bad, but it wasn't because of somebody like Cedric Ray. And if you take somebody like Cedric Ray off that defense, it goes from, you know, bad to, to catastrophic. And I, I do think there there's a pride factor with him and somebody who, who – wants the defense to be a lot better than than they have shown at times. But when Carolina is tied with Campbell and, you know, everybody in Keenan Stadium, there wasn't a ton of people in Keenan Stadium, but everybody in Keenan Stadium almost had that that pit feeling uh, after the past two weeks of like, oh, no, like it, it, is something bad really about to happen? And I think the you, – you mentioned it, the interior of the lines. I, I think that's something where – Yes, North Carolina overcame it in, in the second half and, and pulled away from Campbell pretty easily. But when you do have this, you're going to have a huge uptick in talent for the remaining teams that you're going to see. I would be very worried about Carolina, both on the offensive line and the defensive line, because of the the pushback with uh, along the defensive line in particular, where you know, I, I think that their interior defensive linemen are getting pushed back and that they're really struggling to win the point of attack in the first quarter against Campbell, an FCS team. Campbell was rushing for for six point six yards per carry that first quarter. How worrying is it, do you think, that North Carolina's lines looked like they struggled early in the Campbell game? And how do you think that kind of reflects on where this team is at this point and, and where this team can go the, the, the remaining three games. Yeah, that, that was hands down the biggest issue uh, with me in that, in that game, you know, the first half, you know, I'll start with the offense. Uh, the first drive, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, they let up a sack to a simple speed rush around the edge. Like that, like that's an issue. If, if Campbell's starting defensive end is just whooping our left tackle in 2.5 seconds, like, that that's an issue because the rest of the three teams we play are are going to have way more talent than Campbell, um, and, and then and then just being able to run the ball. You know, you look at our rushing stats, and I think they're skewed by by some of those big runs. Obviously, Hampton had a fifty plus yarder. Uh, uh, Connor Harrell had a fifty plus yarder. So those numbers kind of get skewed when you look at them. You know, I'm looking at just a basic zone read play, first and ten in the first quarter, and we're you know, getting two yards, you know, we're not recreating a, a line of scrimmage. We're not knocking the, the Campbell defensive line, you know, three, four, five yards off the ball. We are kind of getting stalemated and, you know, they're, they're able to put up a fight and then vice versa. You look at our defense and, you know, there's, there is a true known rushing uh, down for Campbell and our interior defensive line are getting knocked, knocked off the ball and Campbell's, you know, Hitting, hitting a hole and they're hitting, getting six yards a pop, you know, and then, and then they're doing the quarterback rush game and they're getting, you know, a 15 yarder and then they get a 40 plus yarder, you know, like if, if we continually get exposed like that as a defense, then, you know, it's, it's not going to be good for the, for the next three games because, um, you know, Duke is a very well coached. They got a good offensive line. Clemson's obviously recruited well, and they're they're still Clemson. You know, they're, maybe they're not the perennial top ten team, but they still have a lot of talent. They just handled Notre Dame. Um, so, you know, when you're playing an FCS opponent, there should be complete domination from the lines of scrimmage from the play one until the final whistle. I think, like I said, mentioned earlier, the skill positions. Yes, they they might catch a, you know, contested catch. They might break a run, but you should see domination from the offense and defensive line up for your team every time you play an FCS opponent. And that's, that, that was the, uh, the glaring issue with, with us this, this past game. 
Yeah, and if you want to talk about complete domination and you're looking for one of the best uh, parts of this Carolina game from Carolina's perspective, Omar in Hampton, 15 carries, 144 yards, two touchdowns, averaged 9.6 yards per carry. Uh, I have a few stats here. He's the fastest. The, he's the fastest UNC back to a thousand yards uh, rushing in a single season since Gio Bernard did it in eight games. Omar and Hampton did it in nine, and Hampton also joined Gio with four consecutive 100-yard rushing games, a mark that no UNC back has hit since that 2012 season. You were on the team with Gio. What are you seeing from Omar and Hampton where? He's putting himself into that that geo category, the Michael Carters, the Javante, Javante Williams. Williams. North Carolina has had a, a ton of great backs over this last decade. What have you seen El- from Elijah him? Elijah Hood had a you know, yeah. TJ Logan. TJ Logan. Like we've had, you know, a, a bunch of thousand yard rushers of the past ten years. What are you uh, seeing from Omar and Hampton that that's kind of put himself into that category? First is just his makeup. You know, he's built so powerfully so he's so built from the ankle to the head like he's got muscles upon muscles he he's he's got a burst that i didn't even know he had you know last year we didn't see it much but this year when he's in the open field he is he's pulling away from people um but but the thing that makes him special is i think it's his contact his contact balance his ability to see a defender approaching from the second and third level and be able to make a miss you know on that on that touchdown run He's got a safety coming inside out and he plants his foot like he's shifting outside and, and cuts back across his face. I'm like, that's really hard for a, a guy of his size to do. And then you see the this you know the straight line speed to finish the run. Um, but just he delivers blows when he's when he's running the ball and he's he's never really going down um, you know, on, on initial contact. And and part of why our, our rushing numbers get so skewed is because he's so good. You know, there's a linebacker hitting him in the hole, two two yards in the hole, but he's breaking that tackle and then getting six. So now, you know, everyone's like, kudos to our offensive line, but it's really Hampton that's that's, you know, should get the the, you know, the most of that because he is, you know, he's kind of carrying our offensive line. Um, but he's a special player. He's got an NFL future for sure, um, and we're lucky to have him because we definitely have him one more year. So I expect another thousand yard season next year. Yeah, there was two plays in particular where I don't remember them going for very long gains, but I just remember a linebacker trying to meet Omar and Hampton in, in one of the in one of the gaps. He blows them back, and then th- their linebacker is down and, and having to get looked at by by their medical staff. And I'm I was just sitting there in the press box thinking, like, man, I I don't know how I would try to tackle Omar and Hampton. And I know for a fact that it would not go well at all. I mean, you, you saw one of his touchdowns versus Georgia Tech. I think it was the, it was the shorter one. And you know, there's an unblocked defender in the hole, and who's who's coming to like spear at his knees or his thighs, which which is the only way to really tackle him. And he kind of like hops and and kind of hurdles and eludes him. And it's just like this guy, you can't really tackle him low because he might hurdle you or he might you know side, side shuffle to get out of the way. So. Uh, the only really really way to tackle them is the gang tackle them. First guy hit, wrap up, and and let the troops come because uh, he he's a load to bring down. He is top five in rushing touchdowns uh, this season with twelve. Uh, it's the top mark in the ACC. And then rushing yards, he's one of seven backs currently in the country with over a thousand yards. The only uh running back in the ACC to do it he's fourth nationally with a thousand and sixty seven yards and there's still a lot of football left to play I think Elijah Hood is is second all time in in UNC single season uh rushing yardage and I believe it's like 1467 so you know 400 yards in in three games plus a plus a, a, a bowl game and you're gonna start seeing him move up move up the charts pretty quickly. Um, and, and I think he's putting together a, a, a first team all ACC uh, type season. It's really him or, or the Louisville uh, Jordan from Louisville. And it feels like 
the, the way Hampton's playing and, and with how hot a hand he has right now at the running back position for North Carolina to have success these last three games and, and a bowl game, you know, maybe even a, a conference uh, championship game appearance, they're going to have to, you know, lean on Hampton a, a, a lot to, to try to get them uh, to victories. One of the things that I, I made a note that Carolina can't get away with against the better teams. It was the interior line and it was also the coaching mishaps and special team blunders. The end of first half, uh, Carolina gets a first down to stop the clock. You would think that they would go up to the line and, and spike the ball, but half the, the hurried field goal team comes out on the field. Half the offense is coming off. It, we really didn't get any clarification on, on what happened. I think Mac Brown said they have to figure out what happened, and uh, it was just a, a, a miscommunication, and nobody really sent that field goal unit out. But the way the offense was coming out, it, it, it did seem like somebody was at least telling them to get off the field. What did you kind of make of, of that situation? And, you know, yes, you could get away with it against an FCS team like Campbell, but – you know, why can't Carolina keep getting away with stuff like that when, when you're going to Death Valley, say? Yeah, I mean, we've had, you know, uh, clock management issues this year, and we've had them going back, you know, the last few years. Um, and but you are what you repeatedly do, and that's – that's uh, we are repeatedly, you know, not managing the clock to the best of our abilities. And, you know, any opportunity you get to have a clock management – uh, either success or, or error, you know, you, you get a chance in a game, whether it's Campbell, Clemson, or Duke, you know, the one versus Campbell before the half means just as much as the one versus Clemson. It's another opportunity to do it live. You know, we, you practice that all week, you know, the situation where you, you have to either spike a ball or you down it and run the field goal unit on. And if the clock's running, you never, if, if the clock is under 15 seconds, you never have time to get the field goal unit on and get a kickoff. So when, when the catch was made at 10 seconds, the field goal unit should know, look, it's 10 seconds. They have to run a, They have to go snap the ball and spike it because there's no possible way we can get on the field, get set, get the kicker lined up in 10 seconds and get the kickoff. It's 15 is, is the, is the mark that you're looking for. So this is definitely a, a coaching error, I believe, because there should be a coach with the field goal unit. And it's usually the offensive line coach who is saying, like, you're with me, you're staying here, and they usually have a special word. I don't know what Carolina uses. But, you know, it's it's hold, hold, hold until if, – if it's under, obviously you caught it with 10 seconds, so you got to wait for Drake to go to go spike the ball. But say it was 17 seconds, then you could, you know, use that special word and then, you know, interchange your offense for your special team or your kicking unit. But uh, – so I'm going to – I'm going to once again put that on the coaches because, you know, that's – they're the ones making the substitutions there. So – uh, just like I said, another another blunder. It obviously didn't didn't hurt us in the long run, but it is another opportunity for us to to get better at stuff like that. So we'll, hopefully, it doesn't hurt us going forward. Yeah, it's something that Carolina can't get away with when when you're looking at these these next three games and uh, Carolina needing a, a big finish to the year. But before we keep going with this podcast, I have to remind everybody about Johnny T shirt. Johnny T shirt is friends of the podcast so you should want to support them they've got everything you could want when it comes to carolina apparel you could visit them on franklin street or you could visit them at johnny t-shirt.com they've got the hats the football gear it's basketball season two now shot carolina basketball starting up today uh, a 7 p.m tip against radford uh they'll have the basketball gear they're always running great sales it's great people great customer service and don't forget inside carolina premium subscribers save 10 percent off their orders shot one of the one of the best parts about a game like campbell is is you get to see some young players and you get a a preview of of the future of a football team it's a different era now with with the transfer portal and how quickly you can rebuild a team and, and maybe you don't have the the same development as, as you know you did 10 years ago uh but what kind of what young players from this Carolina team impressed you in the Campbell game? Uh, I mean, the first one is Bo Atkinson, and he's impressed all year. He's you know he had a sack in the opener versus South Carolina, so he's he's played a good amount of steps for for a redshirt freshman. But 
Um, he, he's got the motor, you know, Max Crosby, I don't want to, you know, compare him to an all pro, but Max Crosby, you know, plays with the same relentless motor that Bo does. And he showed some, some pass rush ability. Um, and obviously he's going to keep bulking up, but I, I think he's going to be an all ACC type defensive end in the future. I, I really think he's, you know, he's not like the most athletic and most, you know, flexible and twitchy, but like he's a, he's just a football player. And that phrase is often overused, but Bo, Bo has it. Um, Amari Campbell is another guy. It's nice to see a young linebacker step up because we've really seen Power Eccles and Cedric Gray be mainstays for the last two, three years. Um, the thing that I like about him when he gets in the game is he makes splash plays. You know, as a, as a linebacker, that's, I know that's what they look for in the NFL is guys. And what I mean by splash plays are not just tackles. I don't want to see you have 12 tackles in a game. I want to see you have tackles for loss, tip balls, interceptions, force fumbles, sacks, you know, bigger plays than just, you know, tackles. And Amari in his limited time this year has had a, had a interception and a big sack. So he's, he's getting in there and making, making uh, splash plays when he gets in the game. Then you move to the offensive side of the ball and you see Connor Harrell, you know, I think there was a, there's a, obviously a lot of question marks. You know, when Drake leaves, who's going to be the guy? Are we going to go in the portal and get another guy, or is you know is he the heir apparent to Drake? We don't really know yet. He it was very limited snaps, but one thing he can do is really run. And you know, he, he threw a good deep ball to Chris Culliver. Um, you know, we, we've had some success with running quarterbacks in the past. Marquise Williams could really run, so uh, I, I think Connor Harrell has has some development to do. But it was good to see him. You know, get some live action. Um, Doc Chapman is another guy the last two weeks we've seen have explosive plays. He's got that, that extra gear that we've really been looking for, kind of like uh, uh, Daz Newsom. You know, he kind of reminds me of him. You know, he, he can return kicks, return punts. You know, is a, is a quick shifty slot that really has that zero to 10 acceleration. So look forward to him to make, make some plays in the next three or four games. But uh, those are, those are kind of the five that stuck out to me. Yeah, I, I think with somebody like Connor Harrell, Carolina is almost certainly gonna, going to at least bring in a quarterback to compete with him um, from the transfer portal. But I think what you saw from Connor Harrell was encouraging if if you are Carolina because normally the backup quarterback comes in, they just hand the ball off a few times, you, you get to the next game. But I think in, in a game like Campbell, Connor Harrell was able to display what he could do. He had that the huge throw to Chris Culver. Uh, he has the the sixty one yard rushing touchdown where you saw the speed. And you know half the battle in, in college football is if you have a fast quarterback, I'm, I'm willing to I'm willing to at least see what you could do because that sure. that just opens that just opens up the game a, a ton and and look at Alabama and LSU this past week. Yes. Milro, he he's got a great deep ball and he can run. And Connor Harrell, I'm not saying he's Milro, but he showed speed and he showed he could throw a little deep ball. So if if you got speed of the quarterback, especially if you're playing the UNC defense, then use <laughs> use the running quarterback. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think the Milro comparison is a good one because there there were times this year where you're looking at this Alabama team and they're rotating quarterbacks. It was uh I think Ty Simpson and uh Buckner from Notre Dame and they're just rotating guys and you're like they, they just don't seem right but then Milrow comes in and he adds that leg element to to his game and um they're they're right back in in the playoff conversation now um but yeah I I do think Connor Harrell at least showed signs yesterday to be like the quarterback battle like Carolina is going to bring in a transfer portal quarterback but it's going to be a battle uh, next training camp to see who's going to be North Carolina's starting quarterback. And, and I did think he had uh, some pretty good zip on the ball when when he was throwing it. Next for Carolina, it, it's Duke at Clemson at NC State. If you had a pick right now, how is, how is Carolina finishing these games and, and, and what do you think it's going to look like? At worst, we're two and one. My heart right now thinks that we'll beat Duke and State and lose to Clemson. Uh, I, I can see us winning all three. I I really can't see us going over three. I think uh, you know Duke without Riley Leonard is a different team, and, and I'm pretty sure he's going to be out for our game. Is that? I'm, is I'm that pretty sure. Hearing? Pretty sure. Yeah. yeah, I heard 
you know, before the weight game, they announced that he was going to be out an extended period of time. I, I think they're just a different football team with him at quarterback. Obviously, they have a great coach and a great defense. But, you know, I think we beat Duke. Um, depends what Clemson team we get. If they, if they are the team that, you know, beat Notre Dame or if we get the team that we saw earlier in the year where, that you know, they aren't very good. So um, that, that one's kind of a toss-up to me. It's always, you know, it's always harder playing at Clemson. But uh, NC State, you know, they have a good defense. And uh, obviously playing at Carter Finley is always a, a tough, tough matchup. But we have some unfinished business with them over the last couple of years. And I, I don't think their offense is very good. And I think Drake – Drake will finally get his revenge. So I think at worst we're going two and one and, you know, we're, we're finished the season, you know, nine and three at worst, 10 and two, hopefully. Um, you know, I, like I said, I don't think the ACC championship is an opportunity. I think we're at, you know, a couple percentage points of a possibility for us to play in it, uh, which is disappointing, you know, given, you know, the, our schedule and how we played early in the year. Um, but, yeah, I, I predict us at least t- two and one at the worst, but possibly three and zero. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think if I had to rank my order of confidence in, in these next three games, I would say I'm the most confident in the Duke game. Yeah, uh, just because it's at home, no Riley Leonard. I, I watched them play against Wake Forest, and, and I, I do think Elko is a really great coach, and he he's going to get the most out of the players that he puts out on the field, but not having a quarterback like Riley Leonard. And I think they're on their their third string quarterback, which at times has been a problem for this Carolina team going up against third string quarterbacks. Uh, I would have the most confidence in the Duke game. And then I would say the NC state game, NC state's just a, a tough defense. Uh, and then I would be the least confident in, in going to Clemson right now and, kind of what they showed you uh, this past weekend when when they handle a, a Notre Dame team. I think the the talent gap on both sides of the offensive and defensive line is going to be too much to make up, especially when they're making the trip over to Death Valley. So I, I think Carolina finishes 2-1 and one this remaining three stretches. You, you win the, the two in-state games, and then you lose, a, um, you lose against a, a good Clemson team, and – Three conference losses. You you're, you have nobody to blame but yourself for why you don't go to the ACC championship when a team like Louisville can go and you know you lose to Georgia Tech, you lose to Virginia. Um, I I think this is going to be a season where Carolina looks back on and and realizes the the opportunity they missed with a quarterback like Drake May, a, a first team All ACC running back in Amar and Hampton, a one of the top three receivers in the conference in, in Tez Walker and just realizing like if, if we just showed up for, for those two games, I, th- I think they probably still do lose at Clemson. But you know, if, if that's your, if that's your first conference loss, it's a, a, a whole different story. And uh, I, th- I think it's just easier to stomach if Clemson's your only conference loss and, you know, not, not dropping games to the Virginias and, and the Georgia techs. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, but that'll take us to our pick of the weekend to wrap this up. Our pick of the weekend is presented by our friends at Congruity. Congruity is a North Carolina based national coverage, local presence company with personal support straight from the Tar Heel state. They are empowering small and mid sized business owners with HR and payroll outsourcing, enabling you to grow your business while they take care of your greatest assets, your people. And they're doing it with top of the line technology and services for every stage of your business's growth with a state of the art online platform. And Congruity does it all because they are obsessed with customer service. They become part of your team. They do the heavy lifting, providing essential admin support with a single point of contact and support available on demand with services that are tailor made for your business. Congruity has helped hundreds of businesses improve and enhance their day-to-day lives, level up your HR capabilities, save money, unlock game-changing growth. Visit congruityhr.com backslash Tariels to learn more about Congruity. Fill out a quick form to be connected to their consultants, and they'll give Inside Carolina listeners and viewers a payroll and HR assessment for free. That's congruityhr.com backslash Tariels. Shot, man, we have to address the elephant in the room. 
this is this is one where we go back and we look at the tape. We could be hard on ourselves. We could be hard on these coaches and players because we're hard on ourselves. Hand up. We gave out two losers last week. We, we, I had Oklahoma minus six. You had Notre Dame minus three and a half. Not only do they not cover, they both lose outright uh, on the road. The second I picked Oklahoma, I had I had regret. And I started to think about it, and I was like, man, Bedlam is, is crazy every year. Oklahoma minus six. They had opportunities to cover that game and, and win that game. Uh, but, again, hand up. I'm in the lab. I got to be better. Where are you going this week? You're you're two and three. Got to get back to 500. I'm three and two. Yeah, I mean, I'll talk about Notre Dame real quick. You know, Sam Hartman was 0-4 in his career versus Clemson going, leading into the game. I maybe should have – you know, research that stat, and he hasn't beaten them yet. But, um, you know, wrong once again. Clemson, you know, when Dabo's got his back against the wall, he, he tends to come out swinging, and he did that. So I'm going to go – look, I'm picking NC State with my brain, not my heart. I'm going NC State minus two and a half over Wake Forest. I don't think Wake Forest is the Wake Forest of old. Um, NC State had a good win versus Miami. Their defense is really good. They fly around, and their quarterback makes enough plays with his legs for them to win. I think, you know, that's that's that should be a lock. Um, and and selfishly, I want NC State to keep winning because when we go there for the you know the uh, Black Friday game at Carter Field, I want them to, you know, hopefully be ranked in the top twenty-five and and think that you know their shit don't stink, which they always do, and we come in there and you know whoop them. So that's. I hope they win these next few games, but I'm going NC State minus two and a half of over Wake Forest. I went back in the lab. I came out. I have a winner. We're going to the SEC. Missouri hosting Tennessee. Uh, Missouri loses to Georgia. But I, I did think Missouri showed a lot in that game, and they hung around um, against the Bulldogs, who are – the overwhelming best team in the country right now. I think I, I like their quarterback, uh, Brady Cook. I'm not crazy about Tennessee. I I think, you know, home field matters a, a ton in college football, especially. So it's right now. I have it written down as plus one and a half, but I'm looking now and it's already a pick 'em. I'm getting in a pick 'em. I I think Missouri wins. I I don't need any points. Uh, go Tigers. Did I say go Tigers for Missouri? I think so, right? Yeah, just not the G E A U X. I guess no, it's just a normal, <laughs> a normal go Tigers. Uh, but shot man, appreciate the time as always. Carolina back in action this Saturday in Chapel Hill for the Victory Bell. It's a 8 p.m. kickoff. Love that. Love that. A night game in Keenan Stadium. Shot man, appreciate the time as always. Appreciate everybody watching and listening. Appreciate it, Vip. Appreciate it, everybody. Go to hell, Duke.